Um, and now we have uh, Robin Marie, I think. Robin Marie, thank you. Come. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Stan. Um, I agree, Stan, you're not shy anymore. You, you have to give up that little uh, story. Um, everybody's been reading from this London book, and I'm here representing nearby Woodstock. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, and I'm, I think I'm relieved to say I don't live in Woodstock. I live outside, but near Woodstock. And for those of you who don't know Woodstock, um, Woodstock to London is sort of like how uh, your embarrassing cousin who's in and out of jail and always wants to bum money off you is to you. Um, and that's by way of prefacing the manuscript I'm going to read from is called Poems for City Hall, a murder book. And it's about um, famous or infamous or sometimes very small murders of Woodstock. Um, and the one I'm going to reference is, I, it's true. I, you won't be able to believe it and feel free to laugh, but it, it's truly south, what, we, what I would call southwestern Ontario Gothic. Um, and this is called Clifford Fair's Toes. Cliff Fair's toes bloomed inconveniently in Mr. Robinson's backyard imperfectly buried, his body pushing up past rancid soil, spring flowers of a different order, spirit flowers seeking home. Aware he'd botched the burial, Doug went out back and dug Cliff up again, hauled him to the garage, cut him up with a borrowed saw, buried the bits in separate holes this time, telling neighbors it was rose bushes he planned. Eventually, Cliff's toes found other purchase, tickling the tongue of Amy Gilbert, seed bones watered by beer, whose bloom she gagged on, and Cliff's toes emerged one by one as words planting their whereabouts in the ears of friends at the Shamrock Tavern. Somewhere upstairs, Oscar Wilde once lay over on his reading tour of Upper Canada and would have wondered at the gardens of Cliff's toes, though Wilde was sharing words of a different order. Cliff's toes, in their new guise, made their way to the ears of officers, and from there, out of Doug's own digits, as letters to ladies from custody. At last, Clifford Fair's toes landed in the witness box, standing in a row behind Doug's chair. Red signposts reminding the court which way the truth lay facing. I, I, I don't know how long you're supposed to read for. There's uh, another one. Another one. Yeah. Four. Yeah. Okay. Um, this continues the story of this particular murder. And I, a real murder? I, I made none of this up. Okay. I, okay. That's yeah. what I mean about Woodstock, being your yeah. embarrassing, mortifying cousin. Anyway, um, this one's called Arms in the Man. They couldn't find Cliff's arms throughout the trial, wondering where they got to, what Doug had done with them in his less than brilliant alternative gardening but he didn't say, and they couldn't discover. Forensics brought in careful excavators, folks with trowels, rods, brushes to whisk dirt aside gently, lest it rest in one of Cliff's palms. Nothing, just a yard torn up on Princess Street. Clifford's arms stayed, swimming through soil, trying to reach his young son in London, prisoner of autism and CPRI. No luck. Clifford came in dream to tell his mom instead, said, get him out of there. And she did, next day. And the day after, a staff member she'd long considered creepy took a different child outside and beat him up. Sad work done, Clifford's arms resumed their swimming, headed now for the island of his ancestors up north and his other body parts put to rest there last winter. His mother said the ice had creaked under their tires. She'd been afraid, 
but they made it to the gray-white nesting place of eggshell remains, to the place where Clifford's arms, free again, were going when they veered off one last time to bonk Doug Robinson on the head so he had the bright idea to speak up finally from prison, admit where the police could locate such full hands, such faithfully lifting biceps. May Cliff's arms fold his son tight each time Cliff's mother does, given everything, though their bones rest with other eggshell. Newly feathered now, we can assume Cliff's arms free to do just that. I'll finish with this short poem, and, and it actually starts the book because there's this thing, when you're writing about real people and real murders, um, you talk about ethics. Um, I figure my only right is because I live in the community, and, and a community experiences things that become public property. And uh, at the same time, um, one has to be aware of the crassness of writing about um, violence and suffering and death when it's real. So um, the book starts with this poem, and it's called Caveat. Poetry's a liar. Troops in its choir, humming loudly to prevent the heart from darker argument. See how even now I press rhythm on your ungainly mess. Stop behind your teeth and mouth the experienced syllables going south. Note, like every con, its gift for the self-justifying riff. Words directed carefully, agenda tilted all to me. Forgive if you can find the space, this pretty fib faked face to face, and lift the book and shut your ears and hurl and welcome every tear. Wow, Robin, thank you. And I actually would like to get copies of your poetry. Oh my God, the two of you. Um, Zoe and Robin, that's beautiful. Wow. Whew. One more page, please. That, no, that is like gorgeous poetry. The other thing I just want to say, because I write a lot about World War II and, and genocides, um, one of the things I'm so struck by in the midst of horror um, and brutality and atrocity is that we, how people always remember the beauty. I, I'm so, and I think that's what poets do, don't you think? But I mean, Stan, remember your wife was like about to kill you because like you like didn't get the right ticket. Um, I've been about to drop this microphone yet again. But I, what I'm struck by is that poets, in the midst of the, the insanity, we find the beauty. We find the uh, moments of grace, the moments of, I think that's really what we do as poets. So thank you. Wow, that was very beautiful. Okay, it's about to fall again. Stand <laughs> I'm like so bad at technology. Okay. Um, but yeah, I really do think that poets capture the moment.